I've been a software developer since 2019. And 2019 software development requirements are way different than 2025 software development requirements. If somebody were to look at this on a bird's eye view, we would see 2025 and the list is like five times as long as the requirements in 2019. And it's insane because it sounds like it's such a short you know, amount of time. The difference between 2025 to 2019 is not very much. But what happened in between that is nuts. And it changed the landscape of work. And remote work back in 2019 was not even really on my radar like it is now in 2025. People are only choosing remote work now. But back then, it, it just wasn't talked about the same way. So what in the world do we do? So what in the world do we do in 2025 to get us a software development job? And I look back at what I did in 2019, and I want to walk through what I had to do back then, and I want to show, I want to talk about what I would do differently if I had to restart and effectively find, you know, a junior developer job today in 2025. So a couple things I did in 2019, this is when I was in school. So this is when I say these things, these were over a period of a couple of years that I was making this and developing this and studying. So have that in your mind. But I created two applications and I launched them in the Apple App Store. And they were applications that I made in Swift um, with Xcode on my Mac. And they I, I got them in the App Store. They weren't anything groundbreaking. They were just a quote of the day app. And another app was like a basically like a collection of of uh, mini games, basically. Um, so I had those two in the Apple App Store, and I made other app, small applications, more like utility type functions, to um, that that used um, an optical camera recognition software to recognize uh, or predict an image uh, when you tap it, and it ran it through a model, and it would it would give you prediction based on what it thought it was. Uh, I made a couple other things, um, and I, obviously I just did like the whole algorithms and, uh, you know, leak code style questions, and I put some of those on my GitHub, and I made a website, and I linked all my app, my two iOS applications on my website. Um, I had my GitHub, and I just kept refining and going back on my resume, and I would, I would try to articulate the fact that I made these applications. I launched them in the Apple App Store. You can go and download them. And here's what I did to, to do that. I listed out the technical things that I did in the application. And I just made it apparent that you can go and download these things, right? So I did that in my spare time alongside of school. So obviously that took a bit of time because I had to learn Swift and keep up with my schoolwork. But I chose to invest that time because I knew that I needed something that would separate me from other people when I went out to get a job. And I think... Not only did the mobile applications help, but I think the website helped too. And I just made the website in Wix. It wasn't something that I made from scratch. I just made it in Wix. So I did that, and I think that that really helped me because it came up a couple times that I had a website and I had a portfolio and I had these things that other candidates did not. So again, this is 2019, and I think that a lot of people have done this route of making portfolio websites and stuff like that but that's kind of become the bare minimum right even back in 2019 it was kind of like becoming the standard that you had that but nowadays it's more imperative that you have those kind of things again just just anything to separate yourself out from the other the other people that you're going to be um interviewing with so those are just basic things that i did and then during this time, I was studying .NET, and I was in a, a C-sharp class. And at this point, I knew I wanted to do .NET. So what I chose to do is I looked around for internships, specifically internships that dealt with .NET and C-sharp. And I was able to apply and find one. And this was post-graduation, right? This I got the internship after I graduated. So I didn't immediately go into a full-time role. I went into an internship. And the internship got me initial experience that I was then able to use, take that, and then put that, list that on my resume with with this other experience that I had in combination with my classes. And I used that all to apply to a full-time position. And I think internships are really valuable because not only do they get you your foot in the door and they build your, your experience, right? 
to to get to that you know always the, always the the minimum two years experience for junior developer positions people ask how do you get that internships are one way to get that because um, that'll give you like four you know three four or five months of experience and if you get two of them you're you're basically at a year right so that that's one way to look at it and I got two internships but one of them wasn't even software development one of them was IT but it was still at a reputable company and so again just adding experience to your resume and so this was the this was the latter half of my college right so this was the last two years that I was doing internships building these applications and doing all this stuff and this was all in an effort to get a junior job now again remote wasn't on my radar I wasn't even looking at remote I wasn't doing any of that I just wanted to get a junior position to get my foot in the door for a .NET uh, development spot and I was able to find one after my internship but again I still went through many interviews I still got rejected I still got ghosted by places and I didn't hear back from the majority of places I applied at but all you need is one and this was in 2019 and 2025 is is this times like 10 right you we you, you it's it's getting a lot it's gotten a lot more competitive it's got a lot more difficult just to find an entry level position and so the barrier of entry is increased and the res, the level of I would say necessity of having just the baseline things that I had back in 2019 you have to have now and then some and one thing that I would do differently if I had to restart would be to add some form of cloud technology into that stack right whether it's AWS or Azure I would I would definitely need to have had cloud experience if I was looking now and for me to have cloud experience all that really would have looked like is if I took one of my uh, .NET applications that I had made um, on my own time and deployed to AWS right and then if I did that then I could say okay it's it's available uh, it's available here you know uh, it's on this you know maybe it's on some instance in AWS and here's you know maybe a list of services that I use in AWS and another another thing that I would probably look into doing as well would be to pick up one of the um, certification study guide books and and just kind of go through that just to have your a baseline understanding of the different cloud service offerings right because that's really what a lot of it is about is just having some kind of general awareness of what's available to you in these cloud providers right in, in AWS if you know about an EC2 instance right that you can deploy to then you know that's that or you know in, in Azure it, whatever the equivalent is in there and so you can you can apply that also to databases you can apply that to uh, logging platforms and so the number of things that have increased or become necessary to know uh, just <laughs> obviously we, we've seen how much we have to know in 2025 but I would have definitely added a cloud provider to that as well another thing that I would have probably added um, is some kind of message broker technology uh, so we're talking about AWS so you could talk about uh, SQS or some type of queuing technology uh, like Kafka or RabbitMQ there's definitely uh, it's definitely become more of a requirement that you have worked or are familiar with uh, event-driven design uh, or you know messaging or, or think different um, things like that so I would have definitely focused more on uh, event-driven design but I would, I would probably take that a step further and probably try to get a book about um, design power design patterns in software development and this takes me to my next point is I would have probably needed to start reading books at an earlier time right now I read a lot of software development books but I probably would have needed to start that earlier had I been applying in 2025 and a couple books that really stand out to me uh, in terms of just having a, a familiarity with a lot of software engineering concepts are going to be that AWS Certified Developer Study Guide book. Uh, you can look at a general design pattern book like design, like the famous design patterns. You can look at like headfirst design patterns. Um, any book really for Manning when it comes to .NET has is, is been helpful. But honestly, 
just generally to sum this up is or books. I, I think I would have just would have read a lot more if I was looking in 2025 like I was looking in 2019. And so all that to say really is, yes, the requirements have gotten a little bit crazy and the job market is not exactly the greatest in 2025, but it's still possible. But it just takes a little bit more effort uh, on an individual basis in order to get your foot in the door. And that's it's that I think that's just the unfortunate reality of what of what we're seeing. Right. It, it's, it's just gotten so competitive and technologies have been changing so fast and it's the requirements just to. Yeah, just to have a just to get your foot in the door have just increased so much. So anyway, it's 20, I I want to say it's going to it's going to improve, but it's tough to say. But I think the, the I think the only thing that we can do is just continually study and continually um, try to stay up on the latest technologies. Um, so thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next one.